Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over in Paris with Larry Lapidus. We're going to talk today about the RISC-V processor model. Larry, when we're dealing with the RISC-V processor, what's different from the instruction set simulator and why? So what we're providing is more than an instruction set simulator. An instruction set simulator is a fairly simple thing, just providing functional simulation of the instructions in the uh, processor, in this case, the RISC-V processor architecture. What we're providing is more than that. We're providing a reference model, a simulation engine, and tools that enable it to be used for a variety of different use cases. Well, let's take a closer look. Sure. Larry, what are we looking at here? So we're looking at a uh, diagram of the, the sort of universe around uh, a, a RISC-V processor model. The center of the universe is the CPU uh, model, the RISC-V uh, processor model. And this is going to be derived from the RISC-V specification. Any customization you're going to be adding to that. You've also got the RTL implementation of that processor sitting over here. The first use case I'd like to talk about is the verification use case, the DV use case for the processor model. And this is something an instruction set simulator has been used for as a reference model for the DV use case. And so we've got that uh, reference model here, but actually there are some other things uh, that come into the DV use case as well. One of these is verification IP. Another of these is tools. When you're dealing with verification of RISC-V, this is something that most people haven't done in the past, right? They typically got it at processor core and all this was done for them. How hard is this? What, what do you really have to keep in mind? You can leverage a lot from the uh, verification methodology that's been built up over the last, say, 25 years with UVM and uh, system Verilog. However, there are differences between processor verification and uh, generic SOC verification. Uh, big difference, just as a starting point, is that you have this huge state space that is the processor, which is a lot different than verifying the specific behavioral components or the even the combined SOC. When you think about RISC-V, though, this is all sort of new to a lot of people. What's different about the verification IP and, and what what changes in the tools? So with the, uh, with the verification IP, what we're used to with verification IP uh, is that it's used for uh, verification of, of, of buses, of knocks, of peripherals. Here we're talking about verification IP to actually set up the verification environment because what we're doing with processor uh, verification is having a uh, step and compare uh, environment. And to do that step and compare, we need to have this verification IP that coordinates the reference model, this RISC-V CPU model, and the RTL, the device under test. So do the standard tools still apply, the ones that you've been using in the past, or do they have to be specific for RISC-V? So the standard tools uh, still apply. You're still going to use your RTL uh, simulator, your system Verilog simulator. You're still going to use your uh, debugger. But now we're adding some additional tools here. Because of that state space uh, problem and, and because we're needing to verify asynchronous events, things like interrupts, we have to have some uh, synchronization that occurs between the uh, device under test, the RTL, and the uh, reference model. And that's where the verification IP and then the tools come in. These tools are not just the simulation tools. These are tools that provide introspection into the reference model so that you can actually see the state of the reference model and be able to compare that to the state of the RTL. And that state may be on, off, somewhere in between? I mean, what are we talking about with states? When we talk about states, we're talking about the, the full state of the processor at the time. We're talking about uh, register values for the GPRs, for the CSRs. We're talking about memory values. And so we need to be able to uh, see what, an, what instruction is executing, how that has changed register uh, values, how it's changed data values, and be able to make those comparisons. So this is just really about getting the processor working, right? This is about uh, getting it working, getting it functionally correct for 
every legal case here. And, and that's that huge state space that, that you have. When, when, you're, when you're just verifying a peripheral, uh, you've got a, a limited number of conditions and constraints and operating uh, conditions that, that are going to happen. Uh, with a processor, it's programmable and a lot can be done with that. So what comes next? Once you get that, all that nailed down, what do you do next? So once you have that uh, nailed down, actually you keep doing it. It's verification. You can never do uh, enough verification. And so one of the additional things in the verification IP and even in the tool area is functional coverage. And so part of this environment is being able to have functional coverage of the full instruction set and even uh, the custom instructions that you might be adding to RISC-V. And functional coverage has always been a, what's good enough, when do we stop, right? Functional coverage is sort of a proxy variable for, do I have any bugs left? And so I think it's a little bit of an experience factor, but it's also part of the verification plan is understanding uh, what you're doing for functional coverage and what's going to be uh, good enough. So one of the things that when, when RISC-V first came out, everybody thought, oh, this is great. We don't have to worry about uh, paying royalties. We can create our own chip. Reality is this is really complex. It's not for beginners, right? Now, it's not for beginners. There are places where you can just get the processor IP. But we are also seeing, especially uh, for the high-end processors, we're seeing people wanting to build their own processor. And doing that allows them to customize it customize it within the spec by which extensions they add in, but potentially adding in custom instructions. And in doing so, they create a domain-specific processor. We've been talking about hardware software co-verification for almost two decades now. It's really taking off because you really can't turn up the clock speed on a processor anymore beyond a certain point. Mm -hmm. Now you have to think, okay, how does a system operate, right? It's the hardware and the software interacting. It is the hardware and the software uh, interacting and I do think this is gaining uh, increased importance uh, now. And, and here uh, with RISC-V, as you're doing those domain-specific processors, adding these custom instructions, you're doing it because you have a software application in mind. And so you definitely want to do verification of that software running on the uh, hardware. So what has to happen on the software side to make that work? The nice thing about uh, the reference model is that it not only gets used for design verification, but it gets used for software development and, and even uh, for architecture analysis. But let's talk about software development first. The nice thing here about using a uh, reference model for software development as well as for design verification is that now you've got the same basis for doing both the, the hardware and the software. And from a high level, the benefit of this is going to be that when you get silicon back in the lab and you bring software up, it should just work. And that actually has been the experience of our customers is that even with complex uh, SOCs, when they get the silicon back in the lab and they boot it up, it comes up in a couple of days, not weeks. When you're doing your architecture analysis though, that is both the hardware and the software actually running on that hardware, right? The architecture analysis does get complicated and now you want to bring uh, timing into it, or you want to bring in, say, profiling of, uh, of the software so you understand where execution bottlenecks are. Sometimes you want to do that just on a processor-only basis, sometimes processing subsystem. If you're looking at, uh, say, an array of processors architecture for, um, for an AI application, sometimes you want to do it on the SOC basis. Uh, sometimes you're doing architecture analysis to optimize the pipeline. Uh, sometimes you're just looking at, should I add this extra custom instruction? This is a big thing to do, uh, and there's a, there's a lot to it. It's hard to do also. So you've got a reference model here. How do you actually use that for software development? What's done for software development is to build a virtual platform or virtual prototype, which is really software simulation. So here we have a software uh, virtual platform. This could be in C or even in system C. And the idea is to be able to execute the actual production binaries that would run on your hardware, but on this simulation uh, platform, on this virtual platform. 
and this gives you a white box environment for developing, debugging, and testing your software. The simulator gives you controllability, gives you observability, gives you uh, repeatability, gives you ease of automation that can be difficult when doing development on hardware. Clarity, what are we looking at here? So here we're looking at uh, effectively the architecture of our reference model. So the reference model is the model, but it's also the simulator engine. You got three pieces of the model up above. What exactly are they? So we start with the uh, RISC-V base model. The RISC-V base model encompasses the full RISC-V instruction set architecture, the full specification. And uh, actually it, it includes everything that's been ratified, um, but also stable, unratified extensions with the RISC-V uh, specification. Not only that, we support different versions of each uh, extension because people start building processors with different versions. So we start with a base model, but then within the spec, there's the ability to uh, configure. There's a lot of user choices. And actually we have over 250 configuration parameters that users can use. And this is all just within the RISC-V specification. The last block here uh, is for custom instructions and CSRs, because in addition to being able to configure within the spec, you can add those custom instructions and CSRs and other features outside of the RISC-V specification. How are custom instructions verified? Custom instructions are verified actually the, the same as the, uh, as the rest of the processor. Uh, there's going to be an RTL implementation and from the DV environment perspective, this is all the, the reference model. So in that, in that DV uh, uh, verification flow for the processor, the processor reference model is going to include the custom instructions. It's all going to look like one thing. Uh, and so you just verify the custom instructions alongside of the uh, instructions that are under the specification. Where do engineers typically go wrong with this? The, the, the simplest thing uh, to do in terms of verification of custom instructions is to simply verify those custom instructions. That, and yeah, that actually works pretty simply. You can take and, and uh, add the custom instructions in, set up some tests, verify that the custom instructions are working correctly. But now you've added those custom instructions. Has it changed any behavior in the uh, core processor? What happens in the case of interrupts? Uh, and do your custom instructions still behave under uh, these uh, interesting circumstances? And so thinking about all the, uh, all the cases, um, this, is where, uh, this is where we've seen engineers not go wrong, but they, they're, they're just not used to uh, doing processor verification and thinking about the really expansive uh, state space that's needed uh, to verify. So generally it takes longer to do it that way? It, it takes a lot of work to verify the processor. Yes, you can build your own RISC-V processor and you're not paying licensing fees, or even you can license a processor from one of the processor IP vendors and add custom instructions. However, you're going to need to do some verification. So there's a, a resource price. But the benefit is that you're going to come out of this with a domain-specific processor, which provides differentiation for your product. And hopefully that's going to give you uh, some uh, advantage in the marketplace. Last element in this, what are the tools and, and how do they interface with everything else here? So the, the tools uh, go back to the first diagram, the different use cases for the uh, reference model. And actually there are two uh, sets of tools here. One on the verification side, I mentioned you need to be able to do introspection of the state uh, to be able to do the verification comparisons. The other set of tools is for software analysis, doing things like tracing and profiling and code coverage and fault injection, memory monitoring, all those different uh, analytical tools on the software side. The nice thing here, by using uh, this same API, the same abstraction layer here, uh, doesn't matter what the, uh, what the RISC-V model is, what custom instructions you've added, the tools just work with the reference model. And again, this is one of the differences between the Empiris reference model and simulation environment 
and a conventional instruction set simulator that you probably built in graduate school. Larry Lapidus, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed.